Good. So, um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, they've opened my mic fader so I can just talk to you now. Um, what I would like to do is invite the co-chairs up on stage, if I might, and we will uh, expedite this panel as, as quickly as possible because I'm aware, I've been told by the WEF team that we are running over, so we've cut down our, our time a little bit. But if I can invite our co-chair panelists up onto the stage, please, please come on up. Um, and we're just going to use this opportunity to reflect on the progress that has been made during this World Economic Forum and perhaps to comment on some of the issues that we heard Dr. Kissinger address, but also to talk about some of the things that the co-chairs personally are quite passionate about when it comes to the agenda here at the World Economic Forum this year. So thank you, my co-chairs, for coming up. Just very quickly, you'll all be familiar with them, I know, but I'll just do a very quick name check. Um, and let me, let me start here. Um, Hella Thorning-Schmidt joins us uh, from Save the Children International. She is Chief Executive Officer there. Um, Franz van Houten is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Royal Phillips. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Sharmin Obey Chinoy is a documentary filmmaker. Thank you very much for, for coming and being on the panel here. And Brian Moynihan from Bank of America, of course. So let me sit myself down. Um, my name is Jeff Cutmore, if you don't know me, I'm with CNBC and we've had a terrific four days here just I think reflecting the largely I would say uncertainty that business leaders and politicians feel about the future and I thought what we heard from that fabulous conversation with Professor Schwab right at the beginning was Dr Kissinger talking about the disintegration of the old order as we understand it. And I just want to bridge out from that because um, I don't think there's a lot of value in running down the panel and talking geopolitics, but I think that sense of disintegration is something that a lot of people feel both in their business lives and more broadly when they think about what is happening in their own countries. And it's that kind of queasy uneasiness that is coming with the very rapid change we're seeing in technology, the very rapid shifts we're seeing in country-to-country -country relationships, and of course the dramatic changes we're seeing within companies and societies, not only because of technology, but because of migration issues, inequality of wealth, poverty, and so on and so forth. So what I'd like to do is just start here, if I might, and just reflect a little bit on that sense of unease and ask each of our panelists maybe to talk about how they're addressing it within their own circumstances and how they are making things better either for themselves or for the people that they touch. Maybe we can start with you, Helen. Well, thanks a lot. And first of all, uh, thanks for, for having us here. I think it's been an amazing week. I've been coming to, to Davos for some years, uh, and there has been a thoughtfulness uh, in the air this year. And I think that reflect, reflect the responsive uh, part of our headline. I also felt, feel that we all we are all aware that there are some tectonic plates that are shifting, uh, and we are understand them like this, but we need to understand them more and act accordingly. Those te tectonic plates are the fourth industrial revolution that we discussed last year, uh, but it's also the political changes that we're seeing. And when we saw the Chinese president speaking on, on Tuesday, uh, I felt that the world had turned upside down uh, and that we were witnessing the week uh, here in Davos where the world had turned uh, upside down. I hope there's room for strong American leadership and Chinese leadership in, in this world. That is my aspiration for, for the future. My task at this meeting, I won't be long, I promise you, has been to remind world leaders, political leaders, uh, and global uh, and business leaders that if we are in need of the next steps or framework uh, for, the next, uh, for our next step, we should, uh, we should look at the Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm very, very pleased that actually the Sustainable Go Development Goals have been discussed so actively here. I have participated personally in a number of discussions. And I take part in the discussion with a double hat. I used to be Prime Minister in Denmark. Now I'm the CEO of Save the Children. Uh, and I've been very, very pleased to see the engagement from business leaders particularly in how they can be part of taking the next step to, uh, to improving the state of the world uh, and doing that with the Sustainable Development Goals. Friends. Well, first of all, it was a privilege to, uh, to act as a co-chair this week. Um, I do agree that we live in a world with a lot of changes. Um, one of the, the, the moments of reflection was 
the, the, the measurement on trust and the fact that leaders are perceived to be lower in trust right now. And I think it caused also a setting for uh, the World Economic Forum um, realistically uh, to say what is our role uh, in uh, and to impact the state of the world. Um, there were many exchanges of ideas. I sense a great willingness of everybody to take their share. Business leaders uh, discussed what their role is uh, as responsible, responsive leaders. Uh, we had um, an appeal to take a more inclusive um, attitude towards uh, business leadership. Yes, we are as businesses here to create value for shareholders, but it must be inclusive and it needs to be anchored around a long-term vision. And the compact for uh, responsive and responsible leadership that we launched here is anchored around the sustainable development goals. And we believe basically that we all need to find a way to contribute to them. Um, and in that way, um, demonstrate to the population at large that um, we are taking our share and that we are not going to leave anybody behind. This is very important. That the, 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 the reception of that was fantastic. We have already over 100 uh, signatures of multinational companies. Um, and of course, we all need to act the part. Specifically, I was very much involved in the health and healthcare agenda of this week. It's a big theme uh, for developing countries. How do we ensure that people have access to health and healthcare and to avoid the huge impact on their lives if a bad episode of health occurs? And for the, for the overall world, you know, how do we redesign in the fourth industrial revolution a world where healthcare can be delivered to everybody at affordable cost and with better outcomes. And there was a great preparedness from ministers to uh, industry to providers to put their heads together and say how uh, we do that. My company dedicates itself to transforming health technology and there's clearly a lot to do. Okay. Let me conclude by saying that uh, you know we had a great discussions but the world need, needs to judge us on our actions. Shamin. So my experience um, as the first uh, co-chair that is uh, an artist um, was to experience DevOps and look at what happened here this week <laughs> Um, to listen to the conversations that were taking place on the sidelines, per se, as well. I saw a lot of empathy. A lot of people were talking about what it feels like to lose a job, what we have to do to create uh, more jobs, but most importantly, some of the experiences that are outside. For example, a day in the life of a refugee. Um, I, I mean, I cannot recommend it more for, for leaders, business leaders, for people to go through that experience, to understand what it feels like to actually be a refugee. It really disarms you in, in so many ways. Um, I also uh, was part of discussions about gender. Um, only 20% of, uh, uh, of the participants are women. And I think that's something that needs to be pushed through. And that was a conversation that I heard through many panels about having more women here represented. Davos has done a, you know, it's gone from 13% to 20%, it's a very big jump, and we're hoping more women are represented um, over here. So um, I think for me, art, culture, was something that was part of many conversations, and I wanna see it as being included in conversations, not being seen as something that is outside of the, uh, the business world. Brian. So first, I'd also like to echo uh, my thanks to Klaus and the staff of the, of the great institution that the World Economic Forum represents to put on this wonderful venue and wonderful capabilities and wonderful thought-provoking uh, work. So thank you, Klaus, and uh, it's an honor to serve as a, as a co-chair of the event along with my colleagues. And so not to, there's been a lot of discussion here, but I, I'd say if you think about the theme of responsive and responsible leadership, you're actually, interestingly, in a day where a new president's coming into my country, at a time when it's always an optimism, a peaceful change of power. You're also witnessing a, a question of what a response would mean, which is listen to everyone. Listen to all constituencies, take into account all constituencies, try to figure out not the people who agree with you, but the people who don't agree with you, what they think and how to approach it. And I think this institution, this gathering, this dialogue around a whole series of topics, cybersecurity, reproductive science, refugees, it, it, it has a unique opportunity and as I walk through the halls and participate in various 
activities. That uniqueness of being able to hear from the people who are on the other, who you need to be responsive to and are representing those people, I think is key. And then like Franz, I'd say that as a business leader, you know, we aren't judged by being responsive, we're also judged by being responsible. And responsible means how we conduct ourselves and how we behave and how we run our companies and how we think about all the different constituencies that we have listened to by being responsive. I think the compact and the commitment and the commitment to act, I think, was resounding among the business community, balancing long-term, short-term, dealing with the impacts of the change and the way people work and how they're going to work and the impact of technology on just work content. These are major themes, and I think we learned a lot from each other, and it was a tremendous week. As co-chairs, you, you have a, a remarkable position where you get to see a lot across what happens in Davos, and you get to touch lots of different industries and areas of society beyond your own. What I've noticed with Davos, as you keep coming back year after year, is that there'll be a conversation that kicks off an idea. That idea will lead to a promise. That promise then becomes a commitment, and very quickly that commitment becomes a goal and a target, and somebody finally writes a check. That's one of the wonderful things about what happens here sometimes. I just want to tap into what you've experienced this week. Has anybody had one of those moments where they've just thought, my goodness, that was a really good idea. I wonder how we get that to turn into a promise, and then we twist somebody else's arm and get them to make a commitment, and ultimately that will turn into something that will do some good. Please, it's, a, it's an open question. Who feels that they've been, they've, they've been touched that way this week? Well, the good news is, I think, if you think about the, uh, in the business community session, the idea that we would be beyond just signing compact, but also talking to key performance indicators and the commitment to try to, it, is, it wasn't a check, but a commitment, because that's, it's time to figure out how you would measure the sustainability, the, the sustainable go development goals, and how we'd actually then measure it relative to your company, and how maybe an index could be constructed. It's very concrete, because then you can have a benchmark across various industries, various constituents in industry, and even potentially to non-governmental, non non-for-profit uh, industry uh, mm -hmm. to figure it out. I think, so it wasn't a check, but it was, we commit time, and time is a commitment. It's just like a check. When we committed we'd do that, that means behind it, we've got to figure out all those indices and how they portray and how those KPIs will go through our system. Uh, yeah. I, I saw something that, that um, showed me the power of Davos, which is there was a session where uh, one of the 40 cultural uh, leaders that have been brought here, Sarah, um, was showcasing a platform she's developing about uh, mapping archaeological sites um, around the world in real time so that people can feed in information on what's being looted, what's happening. And she is starting off with Peru. So she was talking about Peru, and she's talking about how they're setting up all of this thing and it's about to launch and she ends her presentation and up comes a hand and a man gets up and introduces himself as the Prime Minister of Peru and says that I would like to help you um, and you're welcome to come in and the government is going to partner with you on this project. That to me sh showed the real power of Davos and the collaborations that can take place here. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Friends. Um, yeah, I'd like to come back on, on, on health. Um, the convening power of, of the World Economic Forum is very good. You know, you get um, governments, business providers, civic society all together. And whereas maybe in the past there was more mistrust among participants, the, the notion that public-private partnership is required to find solutions and that connections need to be built, um, I found that willingness very, very great. And so real discussions have taken place on how to transform the delivery of care to more people. Let's not forget, you know, the world moves from seven to nine billion people, aging population, um, healthcare costs need to be contained, yet access need to be en enhanced. And, and that is a problem that in a siloed healthcare world is not easily solved. And then you get all these people here together coming to solutions. I really like that. I think the most amazing thing at this year's meeting is uh, that we feel that we have come a long way in understanding how economic globalization is not working. Everyone is talking about the lack of equality, that there are winners and losers of uh, globalization, and that somehow we need to fix it. That's one thing. But what impresses me actually even more is I've spoken to many business uh, leaders 
at this, uh, at this meeting, many business leaders. And there's no sense for me that business leaders are turning away from the obligation or the task of doing something. That's very powerful. I know that's the case because in Save the Children, we work with business and uh, a partnership ships every day. But it is very, very powerful that we have a serious conversation. We are responsive. We listen. But we also take responsibility to put one foot in front of the other and change the world. We believe we can change the world. And for me, that is powerful. And that is part of what the World Economic Forum is all about. Right. So just to follow up on that, um, we had the experience the other day. So two years ago, uh, we had partnered with Red, and we announced that we'd moved a significant contribution, a significant sort of awareness raising campaign, uh, culminated in a Super Bowl commercial and some fun things like that with Apple and others. $36 million in 36 hours and things like that. And it was built off a relationship built in Davos. What was interesting this Davos, to show you this has a repetitiveness to it, last year we celebrated the 10th anniversary of Red, and it was announced here. This year, Deb Dugan, the head of Red, stood up and said, we went from 250 million two years ago when we did that to 465 million. Mm. And it was a power of the people recognizing that simple commitment that uh, enterprises had to make to help in that case, and mm. uh, mother-child transmission of AIDS. But to think about, in two years, you were able to double that commitment largely by the exposure created off of recommitting to something that started 10 years ago. So how many places can you do that? It's kind of an interesting fact. And watching Deb talk about that, Thursday night, I guess it was, I don't, Wednesday night, um, was pretty spectacular knowing that my company had a slight role in it and many other companies had a, bit, a role in it that built into a half a billion dollars. Yeah, and I just want to pick on you for a moment because you were on my banking panel and we had a very interesting conversation about how the industry is trying to work with new technologies and fintech businesses and so on and so forth. That's an industry isolated example, but everybody in this room, no matter what business they're working in or what they're doing within their life, is grappling with the challenge of new technology. Um, what advice would you give at this point as to how you deal with that issue? Because a lot of people, I think, would like to just pretend it's not happening and reject it and hope that they manage to make it into their 50s or 60s without it really disrupting their life too much. But um, clearly, you cannot do that when it is coming at you like a freight train. So just, just help us understand what advice you give to people in your business and what you're doing strategically to embrace the technology where it can help you. Well, I, the first piece of advice I give people is the way not to be in our business very long is to ignore that it exists, ignore the demands. You, you won't be around. And so it's a, it's an unbelievably powerful thing that's happened with the, the power that's in mobile devices in people's pockets on 24 by 7 and, the, as I said, the social mores of being able to look at them in the sessions like this that you've never been able to do with other types of devices. So that's just a powerful thing. And I think if you don't get on with it and don't get into it, your company will fail. But we have to deal, to the earlier point, with the outcome of that, which is we have a lot less people working in our industry than we used to because of the electronification of activity and we have to help provide through our, what we do in communities and other places the balance to that. And so we have to create the development to replace the employee count that our industry is going to have come down. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you got to get on with it, you won't be successful. And the thing that's coming next, AI or other types of things are going to bury even more. Um, but at the same time, that responsible part that Franz mentioned earlier, the compact and the, the awareness Klaus built about the fourth industrial revolution, it is happening and we have to help through our other work to build out the uh, capabilities in communities to deal with and re-employ, and that's being responsive, because that's what they're telling us. Yeah, I mean, you've seen the public policy side of this, Heli, so, so give us your thoughts. No, I think we have to, uh, first of all, understand that technology and digital uh, changes are happening, and I think we do by now. Uh, but as legacy institutions, Save the Children is almost 100 years old. We were starting in 1919, and many of uh, the organizations we talk here are legacy institutions. We have to ask ourselves, how can we use this new technology to help the people we are serving? And, <clears throat> excuse me, I lost my voice as well. Um, and I am absolutely convinced that all the new technology we are seeing will have one side to it that can be negatively disruptive, but also one side to it that can be extremely positive. 
We have apps that make refugees find each other when they have been lost from each other. Children find their family. We have bi biometrics that actually means that you, you, you can be recognized. Uh, we have uh, learning on a, in a digital way, so we don't have to build schools for refugee children to, to learn. So I have, the, I have a strong point of view that if we if we understand this and apply the new technology, we will be able to take some faster moves for the most deprived people on this world. For the 350 million children that are experiencing extreme poverty, we will be able to help them better if we apply technology better. And I've heard many examples of that this week, very inspirational. Franz. Yeah, I, I was in several sessions around digital and also with some, some government leaders. And the discussion came about um, if, if we all need to work longer, let's say up till late 60s, maybe even 70. Um, and with the digitization, the fourth industrial revolution happening, you cannot assume that the skills that you learn at school will be sufficient to get you to retirement. Right? And many jobs today didn't exist 10 years ago. And uh, the discussion that lifelong learning needs to be far stronger embedded in the fabric of society was an insight that I saw many people uh, uh, walk away with, uh, but I'm not sure that we have fully actioned it. Now, businesses have a role to play in also lifelong learning and reskilling, uh, but I, uh, in that government session where I was, I saw people also taking notes, you know, we, we need to do more about this. Mm. Because maybe that's also where part of that lack of trust comes from, where people are worried to lose their jobs and maybe are not prepared for a digital uh, future and a, and a different kind of job. So I think we have still a lot of work to do there. Um, I, I want to wrap up, um, Shamin, by coming to you, if I might, here, because um, is this your first? No. It's not your first, okay. But, um, I think I would be interested in your perspective in answering this question. Um, when people look at Davos from the outside, you know, you get this kind of lazy shorthand, it's all about Davos man and woman, it's a particular kind of person that attends, um, and, you know, they, they just sit around and drink champagne and <laughs> come up with easy answers to very complicated solutions. Um, but actually, quite often, the, the solutions are achieved at a, a very local level, in fact, mostly at a local level, even though there may be some top-down agenda. So just as we wrap up here, um, just some thoughts from you on how everybody in this room can leave the World Economic Forum this year and do one thing that will make a difference for somebody else or their society or a business colleague. I mean, just, just give us some thoughts here about what everybody in this room can take away this year? Look, um, I think firstly, w one of the greatest things about Davos is that everyone is approachable. Um, I think this, 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 this idea that, that, that people have, that they, they are all of these wealthy people who get together and have these conversations about the, for, about the world, the fact is that now Davos is quite inclusive. Uh, there are a lot of people that are coming to Davos that aren't um, heads of companies or heads of countries, but there are cultural leaders, there are people coming from science and technology, and that is making, I think, Davos much more interesting. But I, if I was to say one thing that, that the world needs and what everybody in this room can do is have empathy. Because one thing that we have really started doing is building walls. Um, and um, I think if we were to walk in other people's shoes, um, and if each one of us here would think about that for a second um, as we go about our lives, I think that would make the world a better place. And I think there are a lot of people here that have showed empathy uh, this week, and, and that, would, that would be my takeaway. And that's what I would encourage other people here to do. And that's fantastic that you mentioned walls as we count down to the inauguration of Donald Trump. Thank you so much, our panel, for what a fascinating conversation. Thank you. So I'm going to relieve them of their obligation, but let me say very quickly to you, um, there is a reception outside for 20 minutes, and then please come back and listen to Zora, the Afghan women's orchestra that will be setting up while you are out having a coffee or a conversation about that one thing that you are going to do to improve somebody else's life. And let me just say on behalf of CNBC, we've had a terrific time here at the event, and I'm sure Klaus would um, appreciate me just saying on behalf of the forum, thank you everybody for attending. It's been wonderful.